Welcome! This online author visit is brought to you by Fort Vancouver Regional Library District, serving four counties in southwest and south central Washington state. We provide gateways to information, ideas, and community interactions at 16 locations throughout our service area with online services and programs like this. We're very pleased today to welcome Marcus Sedgwick all the way from England, where it is very late at night. Not only has he made our mock prints list here locally on two separate occasions, he's also earned numerous real awards and recognition as an author. Today, he'll be speaking about Midwinter Blood before allowing some time for questions. So if you're watching from home, please email authorquestions at fvrl.org and then we will read your questions live on the air. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Shall I take over? Go right ahead. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you uh, all a little while about this book of mine, uh, Midwinter Blood. Before I do that, uh, um, as you've already heard, I'm, I'm speaking to you from England. So it's uh, about half past 11 in the evening here, so it's quite late. So um, if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense, it's probably because I'm tired uh, and not just because I'm also old and stupid. Um, and also the other thing I wanted to say is I'm going to speak for a, a little while about the book and then um, I'm going to hopefully take some questions mm -hmm. from everyone. Um, when we get to the questions, this is a book that I wrote, uh, I think it must be about three years ago now, and uh, I've written at least two books since then. So if we get to the questions and I'm seeming to be a bit vague about anything, that's because uh, I wrote it a long time ago. So don't start thinking, did this guy really write this book? I promise you I did. It was just a little while ago. Now, um, I'm going to explain uh, where the book came from. And uh, what happened to me was um, I was supposed to be writing an entirely different book, actually, and I was having a very bad time. I'd written about 10,000 words of, of it, and I was very late with a deadline. And uh, and I, in desperation, kind of, I, I booked the whole summer off, and I went to live on an island off the coast of Sweden, and I rented a one-roomed cabin on this island. No cars on this island. Very tiny, small place off the west coast of Sweden. And my plan was that I would just lock myself in this cabin for the summer and finish this book I was writing. However, two bad things happened. The first bad thing was that I didn't write a single word more of the book. And the second bad thing was that I realized I didn't want to write another word of the thing that I was trying to write. Uh, so I was kind of desperate by this point because I was very late on a deadline as well. Um, and one weekend I went over to uh, see a friend of mine from Britain who'd come over to Sweden uh, to hang out for the summer. Uh, I went to Stockholm for the weekend and I went into uh, the biggest art gallery there, the most famous art gallery I guess, which is called the National Museum in Stockholm, and I saw a painting that I'd first seen about five or six years before that, was a massive painting. I'm going to try and show you, if I can, um, the painting that I saw. The title of the painting, um, in Swedish, is uh, Midwinter Blot, which might sound a little bit familiar. It sounds a bit like Midwinter Blood. It doesn't quite translate as Midwinter Blood, that title. It actually means Midwinter Sacrifice in Swedish, but nevertheless, um, I can show you this perhaps. This is, let's see if I can get this to appear on the screen. This is the gallery, the National Museum, and in the very uh, far back wall there is this painting. Here in this beautiful book, I have here um, the whole thing. Let's see if you can see some of this here. I'll just quickly wave some of this painting at you. Now, uh, I don't know how much of that you saw, but this painting is Sweden's most famous painting. It's also Sweden's most controversial painting for various reasons that I won't go into now. Uh, it's also a huge painting. This painting is um, approaching 40 feet wide and about 25 feet high. It's absolutely enormous. The figures in the painting, therefore, are kind of bigger than life size. And what the painting shows is a kind of scene from Swedish prehistory, a scene of sacrifice, or I say it shows a sacrifice, what it actually shows is the moment immediately before a sacrifice, which I thought was a cleverer thing than actually showing anything too horrific. It's the moment of tension just before this sacrifice takes place. Um, and the first time I say I first saw this painting about five or six years uh, before I wrote uh, Midwinter Blood, 
Um, and as soon as I saw this painting, I thought it would be an amazing thing to write a book about. But I didn't just want to tell the story of the scene in the painting that I thought was going on or that you know, I imagined was happening in the painting. Uh, and I didn't know how to do it. So come back to um, a couple of years ago when I was out on this island in desperate, desperation trying to think of a new idea for a book. And I saw this painting again. Uh, and I, again, I was thinking, I really want to write about this, but I don't know how. Um, I went back to where I was staying on my little island off the coast of Sweden. Um, having spent the weekend <coughs> thinking about it. And the very next day, I, uh, I had a very good thing happen to me because in desperation at that moment, suddenly into my head uh, popped the idea of, of how to do it, which was not to tell one story about sacrifice, but in fact to tell seven stories about sacrifice, all set in the same place. They're all set on this little island uh, where the book is set, and that island is in fact the island where I was living at the time, but fictionalised, obviously. Um, and to tell seven different stories through time. So starting, uh, in fact, in the future with a story set in our future and then working back in time to the scene that is in the painting that I saw in the gallery in Stockholm. Um, each of these stories, I decided, would therefore have the same two people in them and they would become two different people in each story. Um, and I get when I start talking about this, people often say to me, oh, you're talking about reincarnation, aren't you? And... Uh, I get very hesitant to talk. I don't really like to think of it as... Re I know it is reincarnation, but I don't really like to talk about it that way because reincarnation to me seems a bit of a kind of flaky notion um, and something I don't personally believe in. I was more trying to think about the question of who else you could have been in your own life um, and what other possibilities you could have lived in your own life. And in order to address that question, I see these two people with seven different possibilities for each of them of who they've become, but just set in different in different times. At this point, I started to think, well, this is also going to be a love story if we have two people who are kind of meeting and re-meeting across the centuries, trying to find each other, trying to reconnect with each other. And I decided that each of these seven stories, therefore, would be about love and sacrifice. Um, but with both of those concepts, both love and sacrifice, I didn't want them to just mean the kind of strict um, sense of the word love, like romantic love. I wanted it to incorporate uh, sibling love or the love that a parent has for a child, for example, or that um, just any two friends can have for each other. And similarly with sacrifice, I didn't want it to just be literal sacrifices, human sacrifices, as we get in one story. Um, I wanted it to be more subtle forms of, of how you make sacrifices for the people uh, that you love. So uh, the, the other thing that people have said to me about this book is um, I often get asked, was it a very complicated book to write? It sounds very complicated, I think. Uh, hopefully when you read it, I don't think it reads too complicated. I think it's quite straightforward when you read it. Um, and people have said to me, you know, was it a very complicated book to write? And I'm going to show you um, just a couple of things that I did to make it easier for myself. So the first thing I did, this is um, my notebook. I always use the same kind of notebooks. I've been using these for years. Um, and this was really simple. There are, in this notebook, I'll show you the first one, there are seven uh, double pages like this. Um, if I try and get a bit closer to the lens, you might be able to read um, that this is Midwinter Blood, part one. Um, and on this double page, all I'm doing is making notes about that part uh, of the story. So what's going on with the journalist in the first part of the story. Um, the second one has got even less actually, there was just a single page on that one for part two, and so it goes on through the book, uh, third one even even fewer notes on there, so I have one double page in this notebook for each part in the story um, it was very important to me that this didn't read like seven short stories I wanted to, it to read like it was one big novel, that all these stories were connected and obviously all belonged to each other so I wanted uh, the reader to be able to um, to spot that I was talking about the same two people every time. They have more or less the same names, although they change a little bit through the book. Uh, they have the same mannerisms. They say the same things very often. Uh, and there are a few other links that go between uh, all the seven stories. And the way that I handled that, um, having got my notes in my notebook, this is something else I very commonly do to plot a story out is I get a large sheet of paper uh, like this. I'm going to just back off from the lens a bit so you can see this thing. Uh, there it is. 
these are, um, it's kind of like mind mapping. I, th I think you probably know that term in America, which term we use here to mind mapping. Uh, so on this big map, there are seven circles. Each one of these circles is one of the seven parts uh, of the book. And as I just move around them, you might be able to sort of catch some of the notes inside. And you might also be able to see um, some of the kind of linking lines between the parts. And this is how I kept all my information, all the facts in order, and how I put in those links between the stories without it all getting um, tremendously out of control. So although people have said to me, this must be a very complicated book, it's actually felt like a very, very straightforward uh, book to write for me. I really love writing short stories, and, and because this book is effectively seven short stories, although I say I wanted it to feel like a novel in, in terms of the structure, that's what it is. Uh, it was a relatively fast book to write, which meant by the end of the summer I had finished the thing and was able to get myself out of that um, desperate hole that I put myself in uh, by not finishing the other book. The other book, by the way, if you're interested, is still in a bottom drawer and probably won't come out ever again. Uh, I saw um, a friend of mine who I met back in the summer, an American author, Stephanie Bodine. I just saw her tweet about five minutes before I came on air here, and she was writing and saying um, she just managed to get a few more words on, on paper today, and she was approaching the 10,000 word mark, and she said it's not real until you reach the 10,000 word mark. And I just retweeted that because I thought that's absolutely true. I always find if you get to 10,000 words and your book is really flowing, then you're probably going to be okay. If you crawl to 10,000 words, uh, then you're probably going to be in trouble. And it's, it's one of the things that people don't often think about. You know, I've published, um, I, don't, I can't write this, 13, 14, 15 novels, something like that now. Um, but I've also thrown away about four novels, of which I've started about 10,000 words and then abandoned them. Um, but I think it's really important that you do that. You should never force a book to happen if it really isn't uh, going to happen. You know, there's no way you're ever going to finish the thing. And if you do, I don't think it's going to be a very good book. So sometimes you have to make quite a brutal decision. But in this case, I'm glad I did. I threw away that other book, and I ended up with a book that I was much happier with. Uh, as a result. I haven't told you too much about the actual book itself. I don't know how much people know about it. Perhaps I'll take questions on that um, as we go on now. Anyway, that's the book. Um, should we take some questions now? I think that's a great idea. Does anyone want to ask us a live question? Is everybody going to be shy? Don't be shy. Ask, and ask me. I'm very happy to speak about anything either to do with the book or writing in general, whatever you like. I really don't mind. I should explain, I'm speaking to you, if it looks a bit weird, I'm speaking to you from my writing shed. It probably doesn't look very exciting of the picture you've got because all the exciting stuff is uh, behind the screen and, and to the side. So I'm sitting out in my garden in a little shed if you're wondering where I am. <laughs> this is where I work. Uh, well, while they're working up the nerve to ask you, I do have some I can read you that we have okay, gotten. Okay. Um, this one came in. Um, what what author or what genre do you enjoy reading the most? Okay, uh, I think like a lot of writers, I really very very broad in my reading taste. I read, you know, I I subscribe to the view that there are two kinds of books: there are good ones and bad ones, and I like the good ones. <laughs> and by that, I just mean something that happens to grip you. But I don't uh, restrict myself to a particular genre at all. I, I read all sorts of things, um, uh, I mean, and crime, h horror, science fiction, I guess probably the only thing I don't read is chick lit, though I have done in my time, and you know, I think the best thing about reading is when someone, you know, just shoves a book into your hand and they say, never mind what you think it's about, just read it and, and you'll enjoy it. Um, so yeah, very, very broad in my reading taste. When you come to writing, you have to be a bit more kind of restricted because it confuses your publisher too much if you try and dot around too much in terms of what you're uh, trying to write. Yeah. I read anything that's good. Okay, thank you. Sarah, we have a question here in Battleground. Okay, shout it out. I'm writing my own book right now, and I was just jotting down ideas randomly, and I had an idea that completely changed how I would write the book. And I'm about a quarter of the way through, and I don't know whether I should just keep writing and finish it, because I want to get the second draft 
after the, the, draft, the current draft done now. Yeah. But I also kind of want to rewrite it. Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, my gut reaction to that is if you can, you, I should, it's real. I, <laughs> I'm sitting in my little shed here and I have a log stove to warm the place up and I lit it just before we started speaking and it's now absolutely red hot in here so I'm just going to open the window, excuse me, <laughs> very rude thing to do on air. Um, uh, my gut reaction to that is to say if you can bear it and you think this idea is exciting then you should you should rewrite it with with this new idea uh, in it. it it's up to you to know whether you can personally stand the amount of work uh, and aggravation that that will take but I've often found right from the beginning of my writing career I, I found this is something that happens um, with the notebook is you're working on an idea for a book and you're putting notes in there and then you might be putting notes for what you think is another book entirely in there as well and suddenly you find they're starting to stick together and you don't want them to, you want to keep them apart but suddenly these two ideas that you thought were really weird and, and didn't belong together go together and actually what comes out of that is very often um, something much more exciting so my, my advice to you is if you can stand it then be brave because that will be, you know, if you're adventurous and brave and you pull it off, that will be a better book. Good question, thank you. All right, thank you. Good luck as well. <laughs> Any other brave souls? This is another, oh, another question from Battleground. Um, okay. I read Revolver and Midwinter Blood. I haven't been able to read anything else that you've um, written. Yeah. But both of those settings were very bleak and, uh, you know, not a lot of people. And you explained how you did Midwinter Blood and came to that. But is that a trend with you? Do you... Do you um, I've done... Of... Yeah, I've done that a few times. <laughs> um... But both of those books that you mentioned, I've written quite a few books that are set in cold places and set in the north of the world. Uh -huh. They're set in snowy places. I wrote a book set in Russia, for example. I set a book in Romania in the snow. Um, but the more important thing that you're talking about there is the, the question of isolation. And my very first book yes. was about a bunch of children abandoned on an island which reminds you of the Lord of the Flies, I'm sure, immediately, and that's what it reminded me of when I was writing it. Um, but uh, the, the isolating characters is a very, very simple thing to do. If you isolate your characters, w whatever setting they're in, um, whether it's an island as it is in Midwinter Blood or in my first book, um, or in Revolver, they're isolated because they're up in the Arctic Circle and they're miles away from anywhere. As soon as you isolate people, it increases the jeopardy, the threat, and the danger on those characters. Cause, because what it means is, if anything bad happens, you know, if trouble comes, and let's face it, in, in novels, usually at some point or other, trouble comes along. Um, you know, there's no one you can turn to for help. You can't call the police. You can't speak to your neighbour. It's just you, and you have to get yourself out of it. That's one reason I do it. If I'm completely honest, the other reason I do it is because it simplifies things a bit. I'm very much happier stripping away all the characters that you don't really need in the book, all the people, all the things you don't really need in the book, I like to keep it as pure and clean as possible so that we can just carry, um, we can just uh, focus rather on what the story is actually about and, and the emotional you know, situations that the, the characters are in. So I do that quite often and I do it for those two reasons. That's Thank good. you. You're welcome. Well, I'm going to read another question that we okay. have. Um, uh, when you when you first became a writer, wh what made you decide to do that? What was your inspiration? <laughs> I'm la I'm laughing because uh, it's not something. It, it's really hard to. It's not something you choose to do. I think it might feel like you've chosen to do it, but. And again, this isn't I've spoken to so many writers about over the years. Uh, it's like a compulsion. You can't not do it when you're a writer. And before I was a writer, I was trying to do other creative things. You know, I, I 
I painted a bit and I carved a bit and I did, did printmaking and other things. And I was enjoying doing all those things, but none of them were really satisfying me. Um, and I, it was, you know, I was just grumpy. I was so grumpy until I could work out what it was I wanted to do, <laughs> and that is to write. And when you're a writer, you just you just want to do it. You can't stop yourself doing it most of the time. Uh, and when you're not doing it, you start to get agitated until you think of some other uh, story to put down. So really, it is like a compulsion. Um, a happy one, but a compulsion nonetheless. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I'm getting any more in. This is another question from Battlegrounds. Okay. Um, in Revolver, um, I found it very interesting. My, I, I know somebody who uh, pans for gold now, and I loved the part about how the, um, he, he greased his hair and ran his fingers through his hair and got the gold, kept it that way. Yeah. How much research, I mean, did, did you know that? Did you... I mean, okay. How, how did that all come about? First, um, that thing about the gold dust and the, the hair oil um, is an absolute classic example of the kind of stuff, that's what research is about, you know, because if you made that up, you A, you think, come on, you can't really do that, you know, or people wouldn't believe you, but I, I came across that in some of the research I was doing about the Alaskan gold rush, people really did do that. Um, you wouldn't get very much gold out every time, but if you did it for long enough, it was one of the little dodges that they had to try and uh, steal gold. And that's that's why I love doing research. I spent a lot of time doing... It's, Revolver is a very short book, as you probably noticed, a very slim book. Um, but there was a lot of reading and preparation I did uh, to write the book um, in terms of... So the, the Alaskan Gold Rush, which was an amazing thing, the settlement of Nome, that community, which is still up there. They're much smaller than it was... Um, back during the gold rushes and, and those kind of things like the, the, the gold dust and the hair oil when uh, personally I find that I was, <laughs> I was about to say that stuff is gold dust yes that was gold dust I mean as a writer when you come across those kind of things um, you know it's a gift it's exactly the kind of wonderful detail you put into a book brings it to life makes it authentic and not only that it's driving my plot you know that device um, how is he stealing this gold? How did he do it? You know, complete one of those little twists that you love to come across that you can put into a book. Um, so I feel a sense of guilt sometimes when I come across those things, you know, and they're true. I haven't made them up, but I can use them and, and stick them into my uh, book, hopefully to my advantage. So there was a lot of research to do with the gold rush. Um, there was a lot of research into guns. That's where it all started, and particularly the history of the the cult. I'll show, I've got another book over here I can show you. Um, this book's been sitting here. This book I had to order from the States. You'll be unsurprised to hear. <laughs> the, uh, the, all 36 calibers of the Colt revolver. This is a, an American book detailing the history of Samuel Colt's um, Peacemaker, the, the famous gun. So there was a lot of that kind of stuff to do. Uh, I made two trips up to the Arctic Circle, not in Alaska, but in Sweden, where most of the book is set. Um, and that research paid off as well. I came across things, um, the scene where, uh, without this is a spoiler alert, by the way, the scene at the end, where wolf falls through the snow, that thing about there being a solid crust of snow, that happened to me when I was out exploring around uh, this town up in northern Sweden. Um, and uh, crossing crossing a frozen lake, I, I rented a house by a frozen lake for a week when I was up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, and that thing about walking across the ice and hearing it creaking, not actually breaking, but just it creaking under your feet was enough to make me think, well, someone's going to die in this book by falling through ice. I knew that <laughs> immediately. Writers are kind of sick people. They do those sorts of things. Um, so there was a lot of research uh, for Evolve, and probably it makes it the most fun book I've ever written, not because of the writing per se, but because of the research I got to do before. Thank you. You're welcome. 
We actually had another question came in almost at the yeah. same time that was also about research, but since you pretty much answered it, I'm going to go on <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. um, this one says, uh, do you only write teen novels, and why did you choose to write for that audience rather than another? Okay. Um, mostly what I've become known for in Britain is writing novels for young adults, teens, uh, I do write books for younger children as well. I've written, um, although they're not published in the States yet, uh, I hope they will be sometime, but um, some junior fiction, which surprising actually, uh, well, they're supposed to be humorous. They're full of my kind of bad sense of humor. Um, uh, and uh, so they're like slightly spooky, slightly funny kind of things. And I also, um, my first novel directly aimed at adults is coming out in two months, yeah, in March here in the UK. Again, it doesn't have an American publisher yet, um, so that, that won't be in the States for a while. But um, why did I start with teenage books? It probably um, it came out of the fact that I, years ago now, it's 20 years ago, I got a job in a, a children's bookshop, specifically a children's bookshop in Cambridge, not far from where I live still today. Uh, and the thing that struck me about writing for teens is that you are much, much freer to do what you want than in the adult uh, book market where things are driven much more driven by genre. Is this book uh, a horror novel or is it science fiction or is it historical or is it romance? Because that's where those things have to sit in bookshops. The booksellers have to know where to put them. Um, and it meant that it felt to me like writing for adults was actually bizarrely more constrained than writing for teens, where things seem to be much, much freer. Uh, and it was that sense of excitement of the chance to write literally whatever you want, as long as you make it, you know, you have to make it believable and, and consistent and, um, you know, good. But as long as you do all those things, uh, it struck me that it was a much more exciting area uh, to be working in. So that's, I think, why I started out doing that. Um, and it was a very exciting time. So that was, so that was about 20 years ago. So, you know, um, Philip Pullman was just starting to become really big. There were other really exciting writers around at the time, and I found all that very inspiring as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I think things have slowed down a little bit. I'm not getting more questions via email, so I think this might be a good time to pause, and we can we can stop. Say thank you very much for joining us. And you're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. It's been good fun. Um, we've Thank you. really. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> and thank all of you at home for joining us. Um, if you missed part of this, you can watch all of the recordings of our author visits online at our YouTube channel, which is FVRL Virtual. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.